Hi everyone, this is Paul Schmutzler. I'm here today to show you two new cameras from Blackmagic Design. First, we have the Ursa Mini Pro 4.6K, which is an update to the previous Ursa Mini 4.6K without the Pro. And then on my left, I have the Ursa Broadcast, which is a 4K camera. These cameras are very similar, but there are several key differences. And I wanna show you both and then point out those differences so you can know which one would be the best for your work. So let's start by looking at the Ursa Pro. The first thing you'll notice about these two cameras is how similar they are. And in fact, if I didn't have all the accessories on this broadcast camera right now, the bodies themselves would be identical in appearance. The Ursa Pro comes with an EF mount by default, which holds Canon lenses, but you can get several other lens mount options if you need that as well. The Pro is designed to really be a cinema style camera. So it doesn't have a lot of features that would be typical for video cameras because it's expecting you to do things like second system audio, for example. It does have a built-in mic right here on the top, but I would use it mainly just for syncing up your other audio. So you could record audio to your internal video recording to use later with an app, something like Pluralize, so that you can then sync your good audio with it very easily. On the front, of course, is the lens mount. And I'll take this off so you can sort of see inside to see the 4.6K sensor that's behind it. One of the most noticeable changes on the front of this over the previous generation of the Ursa Mini is the addition of this rotating wheel here. This is an ND filter, a physical ND filter that the previous generation did not have. There are four stages to this, numbered one, two, three, and four. Actually, one is no ND filter, so it might have been better to call that zero, so zero through three, but instead they're one through four. And the dial does continue to rotate all the way through back to the original position. So if you get to four on the darkest ND and keep going, it goes all the way back to no ND at all. On the side of the camera, there's an SDI out and there's a 12 volt out. The SDI out is typically gonna be used for the viewfinder like we have here on the broadcast, and the 12 volt also would provide the power for that viewfinder. Below that, there's an LANC controller for lenses that have that option, and then a separate lens controller here. The rosette that's built in here is designed for the control handle that comes with all of the cameras. And then on the back side, we have SDI out, which is a 12G SDI, SDI in, reference or time code in, and then a 12 volt four pin adapter here as well. On the back, you'll see that I've kind of modified my version a little bit by putting some Velcro on it because I was using a atypical power source for this. But typically this would be a V-Lock battery mount. The Pro that was shipped to me had an SSD recorder on the back and the V-Lock battery mount was on the back of that. I've removed that so I could put my battery here directly on the back. And normally there's a cover plate that would cover this opening right here, but this is where you would connect in with the other accessories that go on the back of the camera. On this side of the camera is where most of your controls are because most operators stand to the left side of the camera. Another major change that they've made on this generation of the Ursa Mini versus the previous generation is the addition of lots of controls outside of the LCD screen. The LCD screen that flips out here used to have a lot of controls behind it or on it through the menu system that you would have to access just for some basic operation of the camera. But they've improved on that by adding a lot of physical dials and a display on the outside that now shows you many of those common functions. So we have two physical wheels to control audio volume. There's some basic functions here that will all show on the screen, including your time code, whether it's constant running time code or time code that only starts when you do your recording. And then towards the front, there's a toggle here for headphones, monitor, and iris. And those can be toggled to control this dial here. So I have it right now on iris. If I rotate this dial, it's going to close or open my iris. There's also three quick toggle buttons here to control ISO, shutter, and white balance. So it makes it very easy to dial those on the fly just by tapping up or tapping down on those. Below that, there's two customizable function buttons, and of course the record start and stop button in red. Moving to the top of the camera, there are what you would expect to see on the top or bottom of any cinema camera, lots of female threaded ports, and then below that is the rubber cover that houses your two XLR inputs for audio. And then on the bottom of the camera, there's of course another place you would expect to see more holes, and those are for tripod mounting or the addition of the shoulder mount kit. So that's the body of the Ursa Pro. Now let's take a look at the broadcast and some of the accessories that are built onto it. On my broadcast camera, I have both a handle 
an iCup viewfinder, and an extension arm for the controller. The extension arm, you'll notice, is actually attached to a different rosette that's not on the Pro, and that's because this actually has a shoulder mount. The shoulder mount is a must when you're doing ENG video, because anything handheld with a camera of this size has got to be able to rest on your shoulder to remain comfortable over a long period of time. The rosette here, of course, is adjustable, as most rosettes would be, but it puts the controller arm way out here in front, so that your shoulder can be here, and your control for the camera can be out front. You'll also notice that the lens mount is different. The broadcast has a B4 lens mount, which is pretty standard in a broadcast environment. The viewfinder has a manual diopter dial here. There's also shortcut buttons for functions within the viewfinder directly on top. And there's several screws here on the bottom that allow you to slide the viewfinder in or out. And then there's a screw on the top that allows it to slide fore and aft. I also want to point out that there's an optional shotgun mic holder that can go on top of this viewfinder, which will allow you to put a shotgun mic on the top right of this like you would typically find on most ENG cameras. Now that we've looked at the bodies and the physical makeup of both cameras, let's take a look at the menu system and I'll point out some of the main differences between them. One of the best features of Blackmagic cameras is the Blackmagic Camera OS. It's a really great operating system and menu system. It's easy to navigate whether you're inside the menu or just on the screen shooting. And one of the things I love about the shooting screen is the fact that all of your settings are up here and if you want to change any of them, all you have to do is tap on one and it immediately brings up the options to be able to change them, either with a slider or by using the arrows that are here left and right. So let's dive into the menu system now. The very first screen is the record screen. You have the option of recording in a raw format, which is basically a series of large still images, or you can record in a much more efficient ProRes codec. Depending on your resolution choices, it also enables the DNX HR format found on the right. Resolution goes all the way up to the maximum 4.6K, which is 4608 by 2592, down to standard HD 1920 by 1080. Swiping left and right accesses the other parts of the record menu. The dynamic range can be set to a film mode, which would expect grading and post-production, or video mode, which will apply some color correction to your recording. If you want to shoot high frame rates, up to 120 frame in 1080p, you would have to turn on off-speed recording, and then you want to crank the speed up here in the off-speed frame rate. Also, when you're shooting at 120, you'd have to window the sensor as well, which creates a cropped, blown-up image in the screen. You can choose the card that you record to here at the bottom, and both of these cameras record to CFast or SD cards, and each of them has two slots for each card. Finally, on the last screen, there's a time-lapse mode. On the monitor screen, you can control what you see on the LCD, the front SDI, the main SDI, or all of them. So there's a lot of options here. Clean feed, of course, is whether you want to see all of the settings and parameters, or if you just want to see your image. You can choose whether you display your 3D LUT or not, which we'll get to here on the last screen. You can choose a zebra pattern to help with focusing. Focus assist, which shows a different color on your focus plane. There's frame guides, a grid for leveling, safe areas, and then false color for helping determine exposure, especially with skin tones. Each of these can be controlled individually, so depending on what you're using each output for, that would dictate what you want to display on each. For the main SDI, which is the back 12G SDI port, that's typically going to be used for an external recorder or a main monitor. So a lot of times you would want to have a clean feed turned on, and you might want to have a display 3D LUT turned on as well, because that way, whoever's looking at that monitor will see some idea of your final image, rather than the very flat monochromatic recording that you're actually putting on the card that will be graded later in post-production. Audio has fairly typical settings. You, you can control which XLR port is which channel. You can control the gain here. And on the next screen over, you can control your headphones and speaker volume, depending on whether you're actually monitoring in camera or not. You can also pad your audio sources with either 15 or 20 dB negative gains. Setup is where you'll change most of the main camera settings, including the date and time, language, time code, whether it's drop frame or not, and then your shutter angle versus shutter speed, the cycle rate of the shutter, whether your battery display is percentage or voltage, and then the ND filter, whether you want it to show the fraction, the stop count, or the number that you're on, which is, of course, as we said before, one through four. The next screen over has to do partly with using the URSA Pro or the URSA Broadcast 
in a multi-camera switched environment. So there's a camera ID number here that you could set that will send to an ATEM switcher that will tell the ATEM switcher this number. So since I have this one assigned to camera number five, it would show up on the ATEM switcher as number five. You can also turn on color bars and whether you have program audio coming through the camera or not. If you're using headsets for a multi-camera shoot, you can control your mic volume here. The next screen over allows you to customize those two function buttons that I showed you on the front. The fourth screen allows you to toggle the status LED on or off and control the brightness, as well as several other master camera functions, including playback, which allows you to choose whether when you hit play, it plays a single clip or all of the clips that you've recorded so far. The final screen allows you to set up Bluetooth for some camera control. The last two screens, Presets allows you to import your own presets for custom setups for the camera. So all of your settings can be set very quickly from a saved file. And then LUTs allows you to choose whether a LUT is displayed on your monitor or not. Looking through the Ursa Broadcasts menu system, you'll find that almost all the screens are identical to the Ursa Pro. The biggest exception is right here under the record screen. The Ursa Broadcast will also record in a RAW format should you need that but you'll notice that, of course, the sensor is only a 4K sensor. So it maxes out at the Ultra HD standard of 3840 by 2160. Of course, most broadcasters aren't broadcasting in Ultra HD yet, so they'll typically be using the HD recording standard. If you switch to ProRes, it allows you to switch back to 1920 by 1080. Once you've selected your recording format here, you'll notice the next screen over also has different dynamic range options. The way these were explained to me is, Film will give you a relatively flat, unaltered look for your recording. So this will be close to what the cinema camera would typically produce. The video dynamic range here on the left is going to add some of the color back in, and then the extended video in the middle is gonna be for the typical quick turnaround news broadcast. So this puts the maximum color correction back in and gives you a nice overall pleasing image right out of the camera without having to do any grading in post. So to sum up, here are the key differences between the Ursa Pro and the broadcast model. The Pro is a 4.6K sensor and comes with a Canon EF mount by default. The broadcast camera shoots up to UHD 3840 by 2160 and it comes with a B4 mount by default. Blackmagic developed the Ursa broadcast so that newsrooms had access to not only a great broadcast camera that could shoot the formats that they need, but also be able to provide them with a higher level of production value for promotions and commercials. So that's a look and comparison of both cameras, and now I'll leave you with some relaxing footage shot with the Ursa Pro.